I want to say thank you to Pastor Jason and Pastor Tiffany for sharing this platform with me and giving an opportunity to share my heart. I do lead Bold City College. Where are my students and graduates at? Or you may know me as one of our worship leaders, but I've called Bold City Church home since 2020, and I've known our pastors for about 15 years, like he said. I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to dive right in. And then I want you to put a marker in 2 Peter 1 and head back to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to head there in a little bit, but I want to set the stage for where we're going. I want you to think about when you were little. You were likely asked this question at least 100 times. What do you want to be when you grow up? Now, how many of you remember what your answer was? Anyone remember? There was a season where I wanted to be a teacher. The Lord has a sense of humor. And then there was this other season where I was convinced that I would be Reba McIntyre's backup singer. Now, you have to know that in the early 90s, her band and backup singers were in a plane crash, and they all died. It was very sad, and I thought, okay, this is my opportunity. (laughs) One of her background singers was named Paula, and so I believed that it was my destiny, And so I had a uh, VHS tape of one of her concerts. And while I played that thing on repeat, I was not paying attention to Reba. I was watching Paula. I learned all of her moves. I learned all of her parts because I was convinced that I would be her when I grew up. When we're little and our hearts are full of wonder and imagination and no bills, we probably wanted to be a superhero A policeman, a firefighter, a doctor, a teacher, an astronaut, the president. Professions that to us at the time seemed the most important. So now I'll ask, how many of you are doing the very exact thing you said you'd do when you grew up? Okay, a few. But most of us didn't become superheroes or astronauts, or the president. Some of us pursued paths like teachers and doctors, firefighters, police officers, and even more of us never had it in our hearts to do the things that we've had to do to pay our bills and provide for our families. And there is no shame in that. We don't dream of being a widow or a single parent a parent to a medically fragile or special needs child. You may not have dreamt of being a barista or an electrician, an HVAC employee, which I'm very thankful you are, or a trash collector. You may not have dreamt of being a receptionist or a retail employee, a payroll specialist, or an administrative assistant, a realtor, or a business owner. And I could keep listing out the jobs and the roles that we fill that are represented in a variety of ways across this room. And while most of us are likely not doing the thing we thought we'd do or be when we grew up, we can look around and recognize the value that each one of these jobs hold in the society that we live, right? So now that I'm a grown up, although that seems like a very relative thought, in my mid-40s, my heart has shifted to ask a different question. Who do I wanna be when I grow up? I've learned that what I wanna be and do doesn't really matter as much as the who I want to become. I've learned that growth and becoming rarely just happens. It's developed over time and circumstance, victory, and great loss, getting it wrong more times than I can count, and sometimes getting it right. And through it all, learning to live into the reality that there is no magic red or blue pill, there is no hack or shortcut, there is time. There's lots of trial and error. There's lots of mundane daily opportunities for development that shape who we want to be when we grow up. 
I've spent the last several years unpacking and disentangling ideas and these deep questions that I have about who I am and how I'm being formed. And it's caused me to pause and evaluate what discipleship looks like in my life. I've taken hard looks at the ways in which I'm being formed by all of the information I take in and the faith I inherited and evaluating the fruit that those things have borne in my life. Here's a few of the things that I've learned. God is not in a hurry. I am. I think that if I get there first, do it better, have more, be more, that somehow there is a brighter gold star sticker to earn or a bigger crown that I receive, and this just isn't true. I can learn to enjoy a slow walk with the Lord. He rarely works quickly. The work of God in our lives seems slow. 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 Until almost we think he's not really doing anything. Before we get to one of those and suddenly moments that we read about in scripture, right? And the sooner I slow down to keep pace with him, the more I enjoy the view walking with him. I won't miss all the million little things he does away, does along the way. Think about whenever you go to a new city, especially if it's a tourist attraction, right? And they have bus tours or walking tours. How many of us choose the bus tour? Most of us because there's air conditioning and it's the, it's the way we get from point A to point B the fastest, right? And so we go on the bus tour, we hop on, we hop off, and we get the overview, the highlights. Here's where this hip happened, here's where that happened, this place was important, that's great, but I really am trying to get there, so if you can just speed it on up so I can get there. But if I opt for the walking tour, slowness creates opportunity for me to take more in. I see more intricate beauty and I can enjoy it without this constant pressure of the next stop. Another thing I'm learning is that faithfulness and fruitfulness are the byproduct of time and connectedness to the Father. There are no shortcuts. There's no hot takes. There's no miracle methods when it comes to walking with the Lord. There is only deliberate daily decisions to do so, regardless of your circumstances. One of the great benefits and problems of our information age and instant celebrity and influencer culture is that we have access to almost every person, personality, place, culture, and experience, along with the opinions associated with all of those things. And we can easily get a good look at what something is like from a distance. Next week, I'm going to London with my oldest daughter. And I have an itinerary. I could take that itinerary and I could sit down with Google and map out all the things we're gonna do. I could take the virtual tours. I can read about it. I could check social media to find out um, all the, the tips and tricks, how to maximize my experience and minimize my expense. And I could get an overall feel for what it would be like before I ever pack a bag or board the plane. I can do this with almost everything. A job, go online and Google, find out who works there and what their experience is like. I can do it with a college, a school, a vacation spot, a medical procedure, a medical diagnosis, a new car, a home. We want to experience the fruit of a thing without doing the work to bring the fruit. You and I, we go to the grocery store and we pick the prettiest pieces of fruit to take home, right? We know which places we like to go because the other ones don't have good produce. Most of you all probably don't add produce to your order, your pickup orders because you wanna be the person that handpicks each one, right? Okay, but we miss the work of planting the seed, watering it, praying that it would grow, praying for rain, watching it as it grew, plucking the weeds, evaluating the soil and the plant for pests and eliminating them to protect it. And we miss the joy that comes from a harvest. 
we miss the grief and the loss that comes when the harvest isn't a good one. There are entire cultures whose livelihoods and life cycles revolve around the work of planting and harvesting. And we forget that hidden work that it takes to enjoy the very best honey crisp apple. Don't come at me with gala or red delicious. They're not delicious. <laughs> However, that hidden work mattered. It matters to the person who took part in the process and it matters to the people who get to enjoy the fruit. And I think one of the problems is that this kind of, of bypass the growth process, this culture has migrated into the church and into our discipleship programs. We think we can bypass planting and growth and harvest to jump into a calling. And if you do this, you'll be ready for this. You'll be a good, a good candidate for this role if you show up here. If you're feeling called to this, we can tailor an experience that will prepare you for that. We can help you fast track the work of God and help you get that job, find that spouse, get that miracle or blessing. Come to this group and you'll make the best of friends. Give this money and you'll get your healing. Come to this service and God will do this. Go serve the poor and God will do that. And we worship the idols of convenience and efficiency and sacrifice the constant presence of God that often shows up slow. It requires something costly of us. Most often our pride and lots and lots of repentance and it works deep to transform us into his image. We want instant pot discipleship with slow cooker results. And I have news for us. This is not the way we see God work over the course of history. It's not how he's worked in my life. It's not really how I see him work in the world. And so we live in this tension in our fast-paced society of now and not yet that forces us to slow down and live differently inside this kingdom. Often we look at the life of Jesus and we see the miracles and the obedience, the authority that he had, the quick wit, the ability to cut through the crap to answer the real questions people were asking and getting to the heart of their issues. We want that. We wanna be like that. And often I think our hearts are pure in that we don't wanna waste time on things that seem unimportant or not profitable. We study and dissect three years of his life that was shaped by 30 years of formation. Formation with the Father. Formation with people around him. Formation of restraint and obedience. Formation through learning and studying, formation of laying aside his own desires to focus on what God wanted from him. Most of it happened in complete obscurity and hiddenness. And when he pops on the scene in the gospels, this was not his starting point. Here's what we know. He was born in Bethlehem. He was consecrated in the temple on his 40th day. Before turning two, he was visited by wise men from the east. And at 12, he got in trouble for staying in the temple asking questions when he was supposed to be traveling back to Nazareth with his parents. Hidden days, hidden months, hidden years, followed by almost two hidden decades. And after that incident at the temple, all we know about the next almost 20 years is what we find in Luke 2, verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, meaning he grew up, and in favor with God and man. One of the great lies we believe is that hidden equals insignificant when it is actually the other way around. What happens in our formative years is most often the most significant to our future development. And I'm gonna talk to our young people for a minute. Please listen to me. Can I be your big sister? I won't try to be your mom, but can I be a big sister for a minute? The decisions you make today will impact your future. 
And I say that to remind you that you don't get to decide the consequences of how your choices impact your future. And I don't say that with doom or dread because I actually believe in your generation. I believe and am confident that your generation is going to solve problems and bring solutions that the last two generations have only argued about. But you need to know that the decisions you make now will impact your future self. Here's an example. In high school, I injured my um, ankles repeatedly playing sports. And I pushed through legitimate pain and injury. I'm not talking about like, oh, my ankle hurts. No, I pushed through legitimate injury because I thought that this senior championship or regional tournament was going to be the one that somehow mattered to my whole life if I didn't play. Guess what my 43-year-old ankles wish? They wish that they'd have taken the doctor's recommendations for a slow return to play, steady physical therapy and strengthening, and rest so that they could heal properly. The last seven years of chronic pain and a surgery that has left me with nerve damage is the fruit of believing that yesterday's choices won't impact tomorrow's results. At 43, I need my feet. I need them to carry me, to help me do my job that helps me pay bills. High school me was not thinking about 43-year-old me, but I promise you that 43-year-old me is thinking about 85-year-old me, right? But high school me wasn't thinking about my needs and responsibilities and my dreams. And I promise you that at 43, I probably have more dreams for my life than I ever did when I was a kid. Because I want to be here to watch my kids grow up. And I want to be here to see God move in this generation. And so if you were to ask any older person in this room, I can bet that each one would pinpoint a decision that they made that impacted their lives in ways they couldn't have predicted now. And while they likely wouldn't trade what they've learned through experience, they probably wish the road might have been a little easier. There is great value in the work that is done when no one sees. I think of the Apostle Paul, again, someone whose life we recap like this. He was a devout Jew. He persecuted Christians, and then Jesus revealed himself to him on the road to Damascus. And it so transformed his life that, we, that he went on to pastor much of the known world at that time and reach Gentiles for Jesus. We celebrate his influence and how wise he was, how the Lord used his testimony as a murderer turned missionary, and it's all true. But it is not the whole story. Let's look in Galatians chapter one. Paul's writing to the Galatians and he says, dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. I received my message from no human source and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. You know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away into Arabia, and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Then three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter. I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostles I met at the time was James, the Lord's brother. And I declare before God that what I'm writing to you is not a lie. After that visit, I went north into the provinces of Syria and Cilicia, and still the Christians in the churches in Judea didn't know me personally. All they knew was that people were saying, the one who used to persecute us 
is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Now look at verse, um, verse one of chapter two. Then 14 years later, I went back to Jerusalem again, and this time with Barnabas and Titus came along too. Did you catch that? After Paul's conversion, he didn't go to the church leaders and say, all right, I'm ready to plant a church. I'm ready to pastor. Give me all you got. He went away for three years and then another 14 years before coming and saying to the church leaders in Jerusalem, hey, this revelation that the Lord has given me, it's changed me. I know you know I used to be this way, but now I'm different. I've taken the time to allow the Holy Spirit to help me understand this good news of Jesus. I thought I knew a lot before, and I did, but I've allowed this revelation to be worked in and through my life. And I'm not here to try and take over what you're doing. I'm gonna go do the thing that God called me to do, but I want you to know it's the real deal. This shows that he was willing to humble himself, to take time to make his calling sure and to be developed, to allow Jesus to, com to continue to work this gospel message in and through his life. How do we know that this is what happened? Because of the way he counseled and encouraged and corrected and led the churches that he served. That kind of wisdom and understanding doesn't just magically download. He was full of the knowledge of Torah and the Old Testament teachings from his former life, but he had to wrestle out this formation process that comes by the Spirit, which takes the law and transforms it to life. So what do we do? We take a 15-year vacation. We go off grid and head to a monastery where we spend our days in prayer and quiet contemplation. I don't think that's any of our reality. I would love to say yes, but I don't think that's the point. The point is that Paul and Jesus did not rush the fulfillment of the call that was on their lives. They didn't count the years of, obs of obscurity as insignificant. They didn't assume that mundane meant meaningless. There was no race against the clock. They weren't behind. They were being formed and prepared. And that is the very thing that God is inviting us into. So I want you to head over to 2 Peter. This is Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, the mouthy one, the confident one, the one that would never, the one who would die for his rabbi Jesus and was ready to throw hands or swords with anyone who messed with him, the one with big faith and a big personality, the one who would never did. And he turned his back on Jesus and he denied him. And then he hung in his head in shame at the reality that he became who he would never be. And after the resurrection, Jesus finds him on a shore because Peter went back to fishing. And he took others with him. So that's another message. But he went back to fishing. But Jesus finds him along a shore and he cooks him breakfast. I love a good meal. Jesus asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? You, you know I do. I feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? You know I do and feed my sheep. A few weeks later, Peter is transformed by the Holy Spirit and becomes one of the first people to preach a gospel sermon as the church of Jesus was being established. And so when we get to these letters in First and Second Peter, we're nearing the end of his life. And these little books contain wisdom and encouragement about how to live. Some of the themes are living in hope and submitting to authority even when you want to stand up for your own rights because you are surrendered to a different king and you are part of a different kingdom. He talked about enduring suffering. He wrote these letters to churches in places that were pretty obscure in comparison to the larger churches that were being established in Jerusalem and Asia. 
The places where his letters were read were kind of backwoods, places where people would flee persecution. They weren't your thriving religious centers. This is the guy who went everywhere with Jesus, one of his right-hand dudes and one of the disciples we know the most about, yet his experience and wisdom led him to encourage those in hidden places. Let's look at what he says in 2 Peter 1, verse three. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are those who fail, sorry, are those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse three says, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. You know what I don't hear in this? The ability to make excuses for why we're not maturing into what God has called us to. If you've put your faith in Jesus, you have Holy Spirit living inside of you. We cannot make excuses for why we're not growing. Life is hard. I, I agree with you. Circumstances that we can't control knock us on our butt sometimes, and it's difficult to keep walking with Jesus, but we have to personally take ownership of our discipleship and decide that we will do what is necessary to grow. One of the challenges is that we buy the lie that at some point, it's gonna get easier to follow Jesus. If I can just make it through this season, right? Isn't every, every calendar month, don't we say that? If I can just make it through this month, if I can just make it through this week, if I can just make it through this season. If we can just get this law change, if we can just get this politician elected or this judge appointed, if, we, if my church just had this program or class, or this person would just do this, then it will be easier to follow Jesus. So we chase the things that we hope will make it easier to follow Jesus instead of actually following Jesus. So let's look at verse five. Peter is saying, because you have what you need, and the promises that we get to participate in God's divine nature. That, if, if you ever needed a verse for co-laboring with the Lord, working together with the Father, we get to participate in God's divine nature in the future. Here's what you need to do. Verse five, make every effort to respond to God's promises and supplement or add to your faith by growing in moral excellence and knowledge. So let's break this down. Moral excellence. This is not perfection, but it does require us to adjust our actions to consistently do what we know to be right. There's what we wanna do and then what God would have us do, and we need to get on with doing the right things instead of trying to justify why our way, why our way is better. We know that we're growing when we spend less time arguing and bargaining with the Lord and more quickly getting to the place of surrender. I talk to our students um, whenever we've been in chapels, and I, I like to say we, we're trying to close the gap from the time it takes me to decide that I should obey or that I will obey 
until I actually do obey. I want every opportunity to take less time. Peter says, make every effort to respond to what God has done and, give you, and given to you by adding to your faith moral excellence and knowledge. What do you think he means by knowledge? As I've tried to wrestle this out, I don't believe this is simply about knowing facts or just about having a lot of biblical information. Yes, our foundation has to be the word. And in our culture, we are certainly without an excuse to not get to know the God of this word. We have every version of our, at our fingertips. We can listen to it and digest it anywhere. The limits really are off. It matters to our faith and our walk to know the God of Scripture. And I believe knowledge, though, is, is way more about a posture of continual learning. You have to understand that in the culture when these letters were written, spiritual information didn't come strictly from sitting and reading. Although that may have been part of it, it came from community learning. There were regular opportunities for believers to engage the scripture, to ask questions, to wrestle through and together come to a better understanding of not just what something means intellectually, but more so how the information we wrestle with would impact how we live together in faith community. Am I saying that the simple scripture reading or faithful sermon listening isn't beneficial? Not at all. Thank you for coming today. But if we only engage in these static and individual ways, we're not likely going to grow in, in embodying what we're learning. For example, if I spend my time reading scripture and seeking to understand what the Lord would have me to do with what I read, and I only keep that to myself, what measure of accountability do I have to follow through on what the Lord's asking of me? How easy is it to just simply ignore what he's saying, maybe forget because I got busy, or just flat out disobey? But what if I'm engaged in relationships where we are adding information, but we're also asking questions alongside of integrated community? Now that thing that the Lord is leading me to do or be or a change to make, it's made visible and vulnerable in community. How likely am I gonna be to follow through because I'm engaging more than just my mind in a learning process? So yes, I encourage you, read the Bible. Listen to sermons, read the books, gain all the information you can, but turn it into knowledge by staying engaged in spaces where you have the opportunity to flesh it out, make mistakes, ask your questions, and put it into practice. Let's look what the verses say next. Add to your knowledge, self-control. What do you do when you increase your knowledge? Increase your self-control. Why? Because now I'm accountable for what I know. Self-control can be explained in restraint exercised over one's own impulses, emotions, or desires. Peter is telling us that we need to grow in this discipline. Paul in Galatians 5 lists self-control as a fruit, not a gift of the Spirit, meaning it has to be developed over time and as a part of an ongoing process. Paul, in other letters, lists self-control as a non-negotiable quality of anyone placed in leadership. We never outgrow our need for developing self-control. It would do us well to wrestle with our passions, impulses, and emotions privately with the Holy Spirit and honest community, rather than when the stakes are higher, our influence is greater, and the opportunity for public humiliation is at stake. I always say that I'm glad that social media wasn't around when I was making my mistakes in my younger years. Can I get an amen? I'm glad I didn't have a spotlight on my life when I was making immature, poor life choices. I tell my girls all the time that your digital footprint lives on long after a picture is posted or a comment is made. It's why as adults, we need less keyboard warriors and more training in just learning how to keep scrolling on by, right? Scroll on by the thing you don't agree with. If it offends you or you don't like it, keep going. You have the power to discipline and train yourself in these spaces. And I wanna encourage you adults, that when you die, 
your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren will inherit your digital legacy. I hope that the stories that your kids and grandkids tell match what they read about you when they Google your name. Think about it. It lives on far beyond you. And we wanna make sure that when they talk about me as grandma, I hope that they say she walked with the Lord. I hope they say she was faithful and she let things go. She focused on what the Lord called her and didn't get caught up in drama, right? So while yes, I challenge you young people to be mindful of the digital legacy you create, I would challenge us as adults to be mindful of the digital legacy we leave. I often counsel people to pay attention to when the Holy Spirit brings to light something in your life that needs to be addressed. He is so kind and gentle, but he is so serious about, being, about us being transformed. And it would do us well to wrestle with him and work it out with him and surrender in the hidden places because he is kind and gracious and because he's holy. And when we continue in willful, reckless ignoring of the things he wants to address, typically public demise is the outcome. So add to your faith, moral excellence, knowledge, and self-control. Do you see how these things are building on themselves layer by layer? They're not a prescription, do this and do that. It's a formation. In verse six, he says, add knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance. This is the characteristic of a person who is deliberate and unswerving in their purpose and loyalty in their commitment to the Lord, even through their greatest trials and suffering. I look around this room and I see many who I have seen this endurance built in. You've had every reason to give up, every reason to throw in the towel, every reason to walk away, and yet you've endured. And I want you to be encouraged that the Lord sees and he knows. This trait of patient endurance is being built in and through you as you walk with the Lord. To others who feel like you kind of flounder when things get hard, I wanna encourage you to remain faithful even in the face of difficulty. Remember, just like growing in knowledge was never meant to be established on our own, neither was endurance. How often have you had a responsibility or a commitment that you just didn't wanna do, but you knew others were counting on you and you knew you wouldn't have to do it alone? So when you did the thing, at the end, you felt like it wasn't so bad and maybe you were even glad that you did. This is a picture of patient endurance. So endure. Yes, it's hard. Yes, you wanna quit. Yes, it seems like it would be easier to go back where you came from, but I believe the Lord sent me to tell somebody today to not give up. Why do we endure? Because it's the example that Christ gave us. First Peter says to add to our faith patient endurance with godliness. This word for godliness means worship that is worthy of God. All of this that we're building into our lives should produce a worship that God is worthy of. And I'm not trying to reduce our walk with Jesus to a formula or an equation. I'm trying to actually convince you that we each have a significant role to play in our partnership with God as we live this life. I think the difficulty we endure um, in developing dependence on him to do these things should create a, in us a life of greater commitment and worthy worship. From this, Peter says, godliness should produce brotherly affection. And this starts in the family of God. We must be intentional in our pursuit of love for one another. We cannot say that we love God and hate our brother and sister. We must believe the best about one another. Learn to live in tensions of real relationships that require forgiveness and grace and difficult conversations. Relationships that don't give the enemy a foothold because of offense or simple miscommunication. I have a theory that a good test of whether we're living in offense with our brothers and sisters in Christ is whether or not we can bless them with our words and whether or not we give them what I call the side eye of suspicion. Like you're waiting for them to stumble or mess up. Just watching. I see, oh, paying attention. The side eye of suspicion. Church, these things should not be said of us. First John chapters two and three say a lot about how we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, what it means for our love for God. And if we say we love God and don't love our brothers and sisters well, what does John call us? Liars. 
I've been a liar. I don't wanna be a liar though. We don't do this perfectly, but I pray that these things aren't said of us. Brotherly love and affection doesn't mean parading around when everything's good when it's not. Loving well does mean difficult conversations, clarifying expectations, acknowledging when I'm wrong, asking forgiveness, offering forgiveness, saying hard things in appropriate spaces to the person we're struggling with to better understand where they're coming from. Pastor Rob challenged us last week about how loving well means we have to listen well. What impact do you think this kind of love has on the world? I would say it spills over in love for everyone. When we can grow in compassionate love and empathy for those inside the church, work through conflict inside the church, make room for each other's faults inside the church, be better listeners inside the church, naturally this will spill over on our love for everyone else, which is the way we prove that this upside down kingdom we are a part of is something everyone needs to be part of. What will minister greatly is how we love. Worship team, you can come up. We will not love well if we are not continually growing in each one of these things Peter's laying out. These things aren't something we put on when we come to church and take off when we go out. These things are grown in us over time, in hidden spaces, in our homes, our small groups, our workplaces. So I go back to the question I challenged you with when we started. Who do you wanna be when you grow up, as you mature? First Peter 3.8 says, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you'll be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Am I willing to keep working with the Father to grow and learn, to develop and mature? Or will I be content to come and go week in and week out struggling with the same things over and over? Have you identified an area that you need to grow in? How are you gonna address it? Do you feel like you are growing and you just need to know what's next? I would challenge you that whatever your next step is, the Lord isn't asking you to do it alone. It's why we are part of this thing called the church and I believe that we have a good one. She isn't perfect, but gosh, she is full of people who are willing to walk it out. Some of you need to be part of a city group when they kick back off in the fall. There you can meet and eat and ask your questions and wrestle through where you are in your walk. Some of you need to go through freedom when it's offered the next time. Some of you have been through freedom and bold men and you're wondering what's next. And man, I hope that you would receive from me by challenging you that there is another step beyond that. I would miss a very big opportunity if I left this platform with inviting every single one of you to consider going through ministry school. It is our two-year discipleship intensive where we will get in the presence of God with the word of God, alongside the people of God and commit to growing in these areas we talked about today. Ask any one of our graduates from the first round and they will tell you their lives have been changed because of their willingness to commit to growing. I'm gonna be at the College Hub outside after service and I'm happy to answer your questions and take your information so I can follow up with you. We start in a little over a month and there is still plenty of time to apply. And this isn't just for young people. I want those of you who may think you're too old to know that your age is not a hindrance to the growth the Lord is inviting you into. It is a gift to all of us who will benefit from your wisdom and lived experience. And it's a reminder to everyone around you that we don't quit developing and growing. We don't retire when it comes to following Jesus. And whatever it is, I wanna challenge you to keep becoming who you want to be as you grow up in the Lord. Jesus did it. Paul did it, Peter did it, and lots of faithful saints whose names we'll never know, who have gone before us, did it. And we have to, too. 
I try not to should people, you should do this or you should, shouldn't do that. But I would invite you to consider, where, are, where am I at in my discipleship? Where am I making excuses? And just acknowledge it so you can surrender it to the Lord and invite him in and invite others around you to say, you know what? It's time to grow again. Would you stand to your feet? We'll take a few moments to worship before we leave, but I wanna invite you, if, if you need to take some time in repentance or, or you're feeling a sense of a fresh commitment to being a disciple, I wanna encourage you. The altar is open. But if nothing else, I hope that you will become who you want to be when you grow up.